I have just truly enjoyed being here tonight. So thank you guys so much. You women are just truly amazing. Lightning and thunder I'm hiding under your love Jesus, your love Darkness around me you surround me with your love, Jesus, your love, you are my rescue, you are my savior, you'll always keep me with you forever.
Jesus, Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence in this place. We have so much to thank you for. So much to thank you for. You have been faithful. You have been good. You have never failed us. Not once. Not once. There is nothing but good news here tonight. <laughs> Lord, be with your people. Be with your ladies tonight, God. Anoint this word, Lord. Remove me from the picture. I'd mean nothing. It's all about you. All glory to you. So, Lori, I, be I believe that you've given me a word for tonight, Lord. So settle me down and just let it only be your words. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to switch to a mic. Do y'all know where it is? The one on the floor. Do y'all see one on the floor? Floor. So this one off. Going to be distracting, so I'm just going to pull that right off, slip it back here. Happy birthday! <laughs> Woo! Hey, I've got my birthday shoes on. Look, would you look at those? I mean, come on, come on. I could not get away with wearing those many places, and I don't know that Tennessee's ready for all my shoes. So I knew when I came back to Florida that I could pull them out. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, my goodness. Listen, y'all, and I just have to go ahead and tell you. So we're going to see how long it takes for all of my press-on nails to fly off. I just lost one. There goes that one. So this is what happens when you're trying to cram a whole lot of things in. So Christy didn't get her nails done on top of all kinds of other things she didn't get done. But you know what? I am here, and I am glad to be here. And Jesus is all that matters. But you see, in my opinion, this just really just shows who we're all about. You know, just a little imperfect around the edges, you know. But we're real, and we can tell each other about it, and there ain't no judgment about it. So there it is. All right. Well, just a couple things. I'm just curious. Has anybody in the house been at all of the River Dweller birthday celebrations? Yay. Yay. That's awesome. Okay. How many of you guys have been to a retreat? Yeah, baby. Okay. So you, you know we have one coming up in September in Asheville, up in my neck of the woods now. You got to register for this thing. We are so super excited about it. You just, God is here. Yes, he is. But there's just something about Meeting God up in the mountains, Pam, I'm telling you, there's something special. And that place is anointed, and there were so many supernatural things that happened at that retreat. So I pray that you'll go. I don't know if they've mentioned it yet, but we do, you know, the name of the conference is higher. It will always be named higher. But we do have a theme that the Lord has given us for this. And I'm, I'm just really excited, and I believe it's very fitting for where this particular ministry is right now. And it's out of um, Romans 5, 2, and it says this, listen. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. So the theme for this retreat is going to be wide open spaces, and it's going to be all about freedom, the freedom of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're believing for, for the, for the ladies that attend, that they are going to walk in a liberty and a freedom that comes only by the power of the Holy Spirit. I just believe that all lives are going to be changed that weekend. So I hope that you will register. I believe if you register tonight, you still get the early bird and you get a um, t-shirt for free. So which those t-shirts that hired, normally you have to pay for. So without further ado, Let's jump into the word because God has a word for us. So I'm going to be in Isaiah 17 most of the night. And the theme verse is Isaiah 17, verse 6. And it says this, Yet some gleanings will remain, 
as when an olive tree is shaken, leaving two or three olives in the highest branches and four. It can mean nevertheless. It can mean still. It can mean in spite of what happened. So yet, so in spite of something that happened, it says yet some gleanings will remain. Something has happened before the yet. So what I want to do is I want to give you context for the scripture that we find in Isaiah chapter 17. So at the time of this writing... Israel and Syria have joined forces to attack Judah. And as usual, God's people, Israel, they have turned away from God. And any time that God's people turn away from him, they're always going to suffer. Always going to suffer. And what they did, it's kind of what we just sang about. They began to worship other things. Whether it be fame, whether it be money, whether it be pride, whether it be success, whether it be control, whether it be people, you can make anything an idol. You can make ministry an idol. If there's anything that you put before God that becomes more important than God, that takes more of your time and resources than God, takes more of your money than what God intended, that is an idol. And that's what happened. So as a result of that, the glory of the children of Israel departed from them because they didn't honor God, but they chose instead to worship false gods. So the physical presence, because back then it was a physical presence, the one that was in Solomon's temple, the physical presence of God departed from them. And the nation was overrun by the enemy. That's a lesson for us. When the presence of God is not with us, if the presence of God has departed from us, if the Holy Spirit does not have a place to land on us, then the enemy will run rampant in our lives. So the nation of Israel was overrun by the enemy. When we don't keep our vision fixed on Jesus then we lose sight of his kingdom and what our purpose in his kingdom is. And what also happens is that we will fall for lies and enticements of the enemy. And then we make decisions based on our feelings and based on our agendas. We end up walking by the flesh and not by the spirit. When we turn away from God, we suffer, but also the kingdom of God suffers. So the enemy in this text, it's the Assyrians. And the Assyrians were extremely cruel people. Now, when I say cruel, I mean cruel. I mean bad to the bone, cruel. These are enemies that would gouge out the eyes of their victims. These are enemies that were famous for pulling out the tongues of their victims. They would cut out the tongues of the people. You know, the enemy of this world kind of does the same thing. He ends up gouging out the eyes of God's people so they cannot see in the spirit. And I think sometimes he also pulls the tongues out of God's children so they cannot speak the life that they were meant to speak. So in our story, the Assyrians, they tortured the people by dismembering them. And they did all sorts of other atrocities. So you talk about a fear tactic. They had fear tactics down pat. Because when you see your neighbors and when you see your friends and when you see your family having their eyes gouged or having their tongues pulled out, when they see rape and murder is happening to the children and to the women, when the neighborhoods and the communities and the cities are seeing all of this happen, there's a fear that rises up in them. And so these cities, when they were surrounded by this enemy, 
they chose rather than to be captured and to go through these atrocities, to go through this torture, rather than to be captured and tortured, they would commit mass suicide. They would just say, we're not going to let that happen to our children. We're not going to let that happen to our families. We're not going to let that happen to our friends. So we're just going to take our lives ourselves. That's how bad it was. If you ever have gone to Israel, one of the places we stop is Masada. And Masada, there's a movie you can watch. It's fascinating. But that's exactly what happened at Masada. This entire town that, was, that lived at Masada, they'd been surrounded by their enemy. And they were trying to starve them out. And, and they would torture them. And what they ended up doing is the entire city, the legend has it except one person, they ended up committing a mass suicide. So this is what is happening in Isaiah 17. So God had been forsaken. And God's children paid a high price. The enemy is on the prowl. The people have been deceived. And there's mass chaos. It would look as if that all was lost for the nation of Israel. And yet. In Isaiah 17, 6. Yet some gleanings will remain. So the country had been shaken to its very core. Have you ever been shaken to your very core? But throughout the nation, a scattered few remained faithful to God and they were spared. See, the enemy had resolved to consume and destroy everything. But it says that still a remnant was left. So to whatever extent that the enemy may rage, God will always reserve for himself a small number. Even though the enemy meant that none would be left unshaken, God would not allow the attacks of the enemy to fall upon his elect. In fact, later in Isaiah 17, it says that the enemies may come against them like a flood, but they would be turned back like chaff blown by the wind. In other words, the attackers will always be destroyed. See, the purpose was to weed out the bad fruit so that only the good fruit would be left. There are consequences when we forsake God and when we seek after our own will or after our own agendas. When we do that, We might see joy for a while. We may see growth for a season. But when it's about our will, when it's about our agenda, when it's about our glory, it will never last. And the result will always be grief and it will be sorrow. Man's kingdoms may be built and they may even show results. But if we aren't building God's kingdom, we are actually robbing God, and we're robbing God's people. I don't think there are any thieves in here. So the nation of Israel, they were shaken upside down, partly because of their own sin, and partly because of the onslaught of the attacks from their enemies. They had basically been stripped of everything. But God promised to leave a thriving remnant. Yet some gleanings will remain. As when an olive tree is shaken, leaving two or three olives in the highest branches and four or five on its fruitful branches, declares the Lord. And so Isaiah the prophet He's using an olive tree here to illustrate for us a promise from God. So does anybody like olives? I love olives. I love every kind of olive. I love them so much. Olives are harvested by shaking. The tree limbs of an olive tree are shaken. And in some cases, a rod is used to beat the tree in order to harvest many olives at once. And so, 
there are beatings and there are shakings. Some fruit will fall and some fruit will remain. Hebrews 12, 26 says this. The earth was rocked at the sound of his voice from the mountain, but now he has... The definition of unshaken is not disturbed from a firm position or steadfast and unwavering. The gospel message of Jesus Christ has shaken the world's foundations as it includes the unshakable kingdom that is rising on the earth. I believe that there is an unshakable kingdom rising on the earth. I believe that there is an unshakable army rising on the earth. I believe that I'm looking at a room full of unshakable women that belong to an unshakable army, that belong to an unshakable kingdom that is rising on the earth. It's not God's power or his throne that's being shaken. It can feel like that sometimes, but it's the invisible forces of darkness that are in the heavenly realms. That's what's being shaken. Those who have betrayed you. Has anybody ever been betrayed before? Those who have spoken badly about you. Those who have rejected you and abused you. Those who have created division and chaos and confusion. Behind every face and every situation that just came to your mind is actually a spirit. Ephesians 6 says, for our struggle is not against him or her, but against the authorities against the powers of this dark Yet some gleanings will remain, leaving two or three olives in the highest branches and four or five on its most fruitful branches. So there are two or three left unshaken in the highest part of the tree, and there are four or five left unshaken in the outmost, most fruitful branches of the tree. See, they didn't fall because they were unreachable. They were left because they couldn't be reached by the hand of the one that had come to gather. And they can't be reached by the rod of the one who is doing the beating. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't feel everything shaking around them. And that doesn't mean that some of them didn't get some bruises and some scratches. But it says, yet some gleanings will remain. Two or three on the highest branches were left. You know, all it takes is a few. All it takes is a few. Matthew 18, verse 19 says, Again, truly I tell you that if two of you So how did the few on the highest uppermost branches, survive the shaking and the beating. Well, Colossians chapter 3 tells us, Since then, that you have been raised with Christ, 
set your hearts on things above where Christ Some remained in the highest branches because they had positioned themselves in higher places. This would be a great time for me to plug the higher retreat. It's kind of like David when he was being attacked one of the many times by his enemies. When he said in Psalm 59:1, he says, deliver me from my enemies, oh my God. Set me securely on an inaccessibly high place, away from those who rise up against me. See, that's what God will do. God will place you. When you keep your heart fixed on him and you keep your eyes fixed on him and your mind is set on him, he will place you in an inaccessibly high place where no rod, no staff, no beating, no shaking, no lies, no betrayal, no hurt, no abuse, nothing can touch you. You will be unshaken. And then it goes and it says, and then it talks about four or five olives that remained on the fruitful branches. See, this points to the fruitful branches of Jesus as he branches out through us, through you, and brings his fruit to the earth through those of us who are yielded to him. That's what those branches point to. Jesus said in John 15, he said, I am the true vine, and my father... will remain as when an olive tree is shaken, leaving two or three olives on the highest branches and four or five on its fruitful branches. You know, there's something about the number five. I believe that this ministry is about to begin operating fully in something that's called the five-fold ministry. Ephesians 4, verse 11. But that doesn't mean you should. As prophets who speak. That this ministry, you have everything and everyone that you need right now to walk in a fivefold ministry. The number five, think about God's five fingers. You are God's hands doing God's work. And that's a whole series of teachings for another time that somebody ought to teach. Yet some gleanings will remain. Now, what's a gleaning? What's this gleaning talk about? So at the time of our text, the Torah required farmers 
to leave some fruit behind for the poor and for strangers to glean. Glean just means to gather. It means to gather. It means to take. So gleanings, that's what was actually left behind. So like those olives that are left in the high branches, the olives that are left on the fruitful branches, those are gleanings. They are left behind. Gleanings were to be left for widows and orphans and for anyone in need that could not afford to buy. You know, it looks a lot like gleanings. It looks a lot like they would be called leftovers almost. But see, actually, the gleanings serve a critical and crucial and vital purpose in the kingdom of God. There will be a beating and there will be a shaking, yet some gleanings will remain. You are the gleanings. You are the unshaken. You have been set apart. You have been chosen. And you may, like I, have wondered so often, why me? And I don't mean the good part. I'm talking about the beating and the shaking. Why did you allow this to happen to me, God? Why must I walk through this, God? I did my devotions. I've been praying every day. I've been fasting. I've been tithing. I've been going to church. Why would you let me walk through this, God? Why? Why did you let my sister die at age 16, God? Why did you let my mother try to kill me three times in the womb, God? Why? What was the purpose in that? Why would you let that happen to one of your children? Why? You may be wondering why why would you even have something for me? Because I've made too many mistakes. I shouldn't even be allowed to be here, God. Or I've done the right thing. I've been the bigger person. I've turned the other cheek. I've walked the other direction. Why the beatings for me, God? Why aren't they getting beaten? Why aren't they getting shaken? What is it all for? Why? Why the gleanings? Why being specific? Why the obstacles in this ministry? Why? Why has the fruit of this ministry been denied? Why? What is it all for? Why does it seem like everything in this world is turned upside down? And, you know, and honestly, it seems as if some people have just lost their discernment or lost their minds or are blinded. But the word says that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. We are not able to predict what the things are that can or cannot be shaken. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken until only the unshakable remains. So the olives that fall from the tree when it's beaten or when it's shaken, most likely those olives get sold to the people that can buy them. You know, when they, whenever they harvest anything, the gleanings are not the part that gets sold. That's the leftovers left behind. So more than likely, all of those olives, they've been sold to somebody that can buy them. The gleanings that are left behind are for the ones that can't buy, the ones that don't have money to buy. The gleanings are for the outcasts. The gleanings are for the underdogs. The gleanings are for the hungry and for the widows and for the homeless, and for the addicts, and for the broken, and for the strangers, and for the lost, for the ones that don't look like you do, the ones that don't smell like you do, the ones that don't act like you do, the ones that go to places you would never think about going. That's who the gleanings are for. That's who the gleanings are for. If there are no gleanings, then how will they be fed? There is someone that you have been set apart for. There is someone that you have remained unshaken for. There is someone that you have been chosen for. There's a story in the Bible about gleaning you all are familiar with. Remember Ruth? Ruth was Naomi's daughter-in-law, and they all lost their husbands. 
one daughter-in-law decided to go to her homeland, but Ruth decided to stick with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and went back to her homeland. And under the guidance of her mother-in-law, because she wanted to eat, she told Ruth to go out into the field and to glean from the field and bring back the wheat from the field. So Ruth did that. She went out into the field, and she walked behind where the harvesting was happening and what was left over, the gleanings that were left behind. Ruth gathered those up, and she brought them home to Naomi, to her mother-in-law. Well, someone paid attention to this. A handsome fellow by the name of Boaz. He said, who is that? And so he told his workers, leave her a little extra. Bless her. Bless her. Bless her. The gleanings that had been left behind, the gleanings that had been set apart, the gleanings that had been chosen, they had been chosen for Ruth. They had been preordained for Ruth. If the gleanings had not been set aside for Ruth, then the lineage of Jesus would not have happened. And if that hadn't happened, then where would we be today? Yet, some gleanings will remain. You have been a set apart for the poor. You've been a set apart for the abused. You've been a set apart for the misfit. You've been set apart for the marginalized. I believe, in general, that the organized church is doing a fair job with taking care of the organized church. But you remain to reach the ones that the church is not reaching. And listen, we don't have to fight about this because there are plenty to go around. You have been marked for preservation. You have been preserved for a purpose. See, I see the gardener, capital G, my daddy. I see him at the olive tree, and I see him just gently and carefully lifting and looking at every single branch and every fruit that's on the tree. And I see him marking the ones that need to be left, the ones that will remain. I see him saying, leave this one, leave this one, leave Debbie, leave Allie, leave Carmelita, leave Mary. You leave them. They stay here. I am preserving them for something else. There have been hard things, maybe, in your life, yet. You thought at times you would never make it, yet. You may not even be sure that you're going to make it while you're sitting here tonight, yet. There have been attacks and there have been beatings, yet. To put it another way, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we are like common clay jars that carry this glorious treasure within so that the extraordinary finished, bring it on world, because what that does is it allows the extraordinary power of God that is in me to be displayed at its fullest, and they cannot deny that that is what it is and who it is, because it surely cannot be me. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8, we are often troubled, but we're not crushed.
set apart. By the power of his spirit, we set the captive free. By the power of his spirit, we heal the sick. We bind up the brokenhearted. And we speak life into dead things. We speak life over dead situations. And they will rise again. What we believe in is what we speak. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, it is written, I believed there. No, Psalm 116 says this, even when it But why do I have to walk through these very, very, very hard things? Verse 15 says, all of this. And all of this, I want to stop. I want you to think, what is your all of this? What are your very hard things? to the glory of God. So even in the shaking, and even in the beating, and even in the turmoil, and even in the spiritual processes that are not easy, when it looks like we're losing, when the bruises and the scrapes are still stinging, verse 16 says, we do not lose heart. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. And what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So there was a battle. There was a situation. There was a tragedy. Maybe your heart has been broken. Maybe it's broken Tonight, maybe your body is failing you. Maybe you've struggled just to stretch the money. Maybe you're not certain what the future holds for your children or for your grandchildren or for your marriage. But the Bible says, yet some gleanings will remain. So I want you to remember the gleanings that remain for Ruth. They were chosen for her. Think about this. They were chosen for her, which led to Boaz, which led to Jesus, which led to our salvation. Could you, as a gleaning, have been chosen for someone chosen? What if what you've walked through, you have been chosen and set apart, unshaken, a gleaning left behind for a person that's going to lead to another person that's going to lead to another person who has been chosen to be the next Billy Graham, to be the next, pick, pick, pick your person. That's the importance. That's the why. That's the revelation. You've been chosen to reach the chosen. That's part of your ministry is you're chosen to reach the chosen. Had Ruth only been sitting in a church sanctuary eating the paid for bread, there would be no gleanings. There would be no Boaz. There would be no Jesus. There would be no us. The olives that remain on the tree are to feed the Ruth's that are in this neighborhood that are surrounding us and beyond. And I want to close with this parable 
which I believe is part of the assignment for River Dwellers. And we don't have a musician, do we? I'm just checking, just so I know. No? So we're just going to wing it. I may hum or sing something in a second. We don't need music, do we? This is very familiar, but I want, this is what I believe is part of the assignment for River Dwellers in Matthew 22. You're familiar with this. There once was a king who arranged an extravagant wedding feast for his son. On the day the festivities were to begin, he sent his servants to inform the invited guests, saying, Come, for the sumptuous feast is now ready. The oxen and the fattened cattle have been killed, and everything is prepared. So come, come to the wedding feast for my son and his bride. But it says that the invited guests, they were not impressed. One was preoccupied with his business. Another went off to his farming enterprise. And the rest seized the king's messengers and shamefully mistreated them and even killed them. This infuriated the king. So he sent his soldiers to execute those murderers and had their city burned to the ground. That's not the part for y'all. Then the king said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready. Yet those who had been invited to attend, they didn't deserve the honor. Listen. Now, I want you to go into the streets. I want you to go into the alleyways and invite anyone and everyone you find to come and enjoy the wedding feast in honor of my son. The Aramaic of go into the streets is go to the ends of the roads. And he goes and it says, so the servants went out into the city streets and they invited everyone to come to the wedding feast. They invited the good and the bad alike until the banquet hall was crammed with people. And it says, now when the king entered the banquet hall, he looked with glee over all his guests. So number one, you are chosen. You have been preserved. You have been set apart. And yet the gleanings remained. And number two, you are a life speaker. You are to speak life into every dead situation that you come in contact with. You are a life speaker. It's not based on how you feel. It's not based on your current bank account. It's not based on your current relationships. You are speaking from the goodness of God because God is always good. And if you believe that, then you speak from what it is that you believe. So you speak life, the words of life, over dead things. And number three, you are to go into the streets. In other words, you're to go beyond the walls of the building. You are to go out onto Brantley Road. Highway 41, Crystal Court, all the surrounding neighborhoods. And it doesn't stop there. It says to the ends of the road, to the ends of the road. So you reach one, that one reaches the one on the next road, that one reaches the one on the next road, and so on and so forth. And it goes into the next state, and then it goes across the country, and then it goes across into the world because you were chosen to go out into the streets, to go beyond the four walls. See, I believe that God has been and is reconfiguring this army for this purpose. That's what happens in a shaking. That's what happens in a, when gl there's gleaning left remain. The reason that the people that are remaining are remaining, the remnant that is left, is because there's a reconfiguration. Not because the others are not important, but for this mission, for this purpose, for what God has for this ministry, he is reconfiguring the army. So this is a very exciting time to be a part of this ministry. Teams that are being birthed out of even the original team, it's happening all the time. And there's just more to come. There are plenty of things and we need all the hands on deck. Everybody has a place, everybody has a purpose. This is a kingdom ministry built on a strong foundation, but has no walls. Luke 6, 48. River dwellers, it doesn't say river dwellers, is like a man who chooses the right place to build a house and then lays a deep and secure foundation. 
When the storms and floods rage against the house, it continues to stand strong and unshaken through the tempest, through the storm, for he built it wisely on the right foundation. Yet some gleanings will remain, as when an olive tree is shaken, leaving two or three olives in the highest branches and four or five on its fruitful branches, declares the Lord. Unshaken, not disturbed, from a firm position, steadfast and unwavering. Now, I want to pray for you. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. But I just, I just feel led. Debbie, would come here, please. I'll come to you. So, Debbie, so it's like, you know, all the beatings, all the shakings. You haven't been shaken. You've not been beaten. You've not been through anything. There's not been any storms. There's not been any trials, right? So through all the shaking, and you can name them. I mean, you could name them all right now. Through all the beatings, from the rods, from the sticks, from whatever. But yet these gleanings have remained, right? And what's the purpose in it? So she has a heart for women in a very unique way. And so I am seeing all these notifications of about 30 women showing up at a public restaurant <laughs> to play games, but to bring the light of Jesus into the marketplace. She doesn't even, I don't think, even understand the many levels and layers of what's going on in the spirit realm. You can sit down. But Debbie... I've known you for almost eight years, and I have seen what you've walked through, and I've, I've known what you've struggled with. And the question would be, why me? Why do I have to go through this? What am I walking through this and this? And it's sometimes five and six things coming at you at once, all in one day or all in one time period. And I'm sure that many of you can relate to that. Like, why is this happening? Why would God allow this to happen? Well, her sitting on a Friday night in a public restaurant with 30 women while all these other people are walking into a restaurant wondering what in the world is going on here? Why does this place feel so good? I'm curious, what is it that they have? See, they want what you have. And see, let me tell you, it's all been for a purpose. You've been set apart because as you make those relationships and you say, oh my gosh, let me tell you what I've been through. You're gonna have the world looking at you and wondering, oh my gosh, if God can bring, if her God, who I don't know yet, can bring her through what he's brought her through, then maybe, maybe her God is real. And maybe he could do the same thing for me. That's why. Mary, have you been through anything? Maybe a little bit? Just a little. And the question has to be, why? Why? But I look at you and I saw what you went through. I look at you. And you are glowing with the love of Christ. Jesus shines through you. And you have a story. You are a life speaker. And the question, while you were sick and while you were down for the count, and you didn't know what tomorrow held in the natural, you didn't know. But the answer is, this is why. You were preserved for a purpose. I allowed you to walk through this. You were preserved for a purpose because you, my darling, because there are no walls on this ministry, but you stand on a firm foundation. And you, my dear, have a ministry that is coming and birthing out of you that will reach others. You will give them the hope in the healing power of the Lord God Almighty. That is why. That is why. And for those stories, there's a story every single person that I'm looking at here. Every single person, you have been chosen. You have been set apart. You are a remnant. And you are unshaken because you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. You keep your mind set and your heart set on him. And he puts you in the unaccessible high places where you cannot be reached. You may feel a little bit of that stick now and then. And you may feel that shaking here or there. But you know that you are unshaken you know that you have been set apart. So I'm going to pray for you. If this message, if you know it was for you, I'm just going to ask 
that you, in obedience to God and submission as an act of covenant with him, to step forward and, and acknowledge that, just to come forward and all pray together as a ministry that you know that you have been, you know that that's who you are. Because it's important that we, as a corporate body, believe this together because there is much work to be done in the kingdom of God. And it's going to take us being in unity and getting out there and doing what it is that God has called us to do. And part of that, and for some of you, you may be here tonight. Maybe you were invited and you're like, I don't even understand what she's talking about. I don't know what this thing is all about. But you know what? Here's the thing. You're in the right place. And maybe you came in here with pain. I mean, real, tangible, gut-wrenching pain. I want you to know that there is a healer here tonight. I want you to know that there is a healer in this place tonight. And he wants to heal you. And I want to tell you something. He does want to do it for you. But I want to tell you something else. It is not about you. It is about the one that he is sending to you. So he wants to take care of this business, make you whole, and make you well to get you up and get you out on your way to do what it is that he's called you to do because he's called you to do something. So if you have any pain, any burden, you just come on. There's going to be an altar worker that's going to come and pray for you. There are healing hands in this place. There are people who have the gift of healing in their prayers. You just need to come forth. If you have not been baptized by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the evidence of speaking in tongues, why not? It's yours to have. It's a gift for everybody. Listen, y'all, especially if you have kids. Listen, if you want to have insight into what it is they're doing, you need the power of the Holy Spirit because he will whisper to you and he will reveal to you and he will show you what's up. So you don't want to do life without him. But in a kingdom, from a kingdom perspective, you guys are the ones that are going out in the streets. You are going into the stores. You are going into the workplaces. You're going into the schools. You're going into the places. Listen, girls, if, you, if you're like me in my flesh and you're like, go, 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 I don't know what to say. I, don't, I can't ever remember any scriptures. I can't ever, I can't ever. I'm a, a terrible memory. But the power of the Holy Spirit in me has the best memory ever. And so I can be in a situation and all I have to do is like, Holy Spirit, I need you to help me right now. And inevitably, the word just comes up out of my belly like living water. It just comes. It just comes. See, that happens. See, the word is important. But the word without the spirit is just the word. When you take the word and you add the spirit to it, all of a sudden, you got lightning. You've got supernatural. you got power going on. That's when a supernatural memory starts working. Your brain becomes supernatural. Your body becomes supernatural. That's why you need the power of the Holy Spirit. And if that's you tonight, that can happen. All you have to do is ask for it, and you can receive it. And if you have any other needs, I want you to come forward. If there's anybody here that does not know Jesus as your Savior, do not walk out of here. Listen, I am seeing people just dying in the most unusual ways, young and old. And, and we, don't, we are not promised five minutes from now. I could go out in these shoes and break my neck and never ever see you again. It is important that you know that you know that you know, and you can take care of that tonight as well. So I'm going to pray for you. I want you all to just love on each other and pray for each other and agree with each other because this is an army, y'all. This is an army, and you are on the same team. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence in this place, and I thank you for your word. Father, I just pray right now that this night, June the 13th, 2021, be a pivotal moment in this ministry and in the lives of each person that is here with me tonight, Lord. God, let this be the diving board that they dive off into the deep waters of what it is that you have for them, God. You have a purpose and a call on all of their lives, so Father, let this be the night that they don't know what it looks like, they don't have to know what it looks like they don't have to know what it's going to look like down in that deep water they just need to jump so I am just praying tonight that they just jump jump off that diving board into the deep water into what it is you have for them and you will show up and show them the rest so we are trusting you for that God I pray for this ministry in particular God I pray for provisions for every need that is that they that they have that it will be met exponentially God I pray for laborers I pray for workers I pray for leadership I pray for teams that are 
going to rise up. Ministries that are sprouting out, God. This is a kingdom ministry that is meant to go from town to town and place to place, not to stay right here on this property. So, Lord, we are trusting you and believing you in it. We thank you for your faithfulness and for your goodness. Go with your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. We are down here to pray with you. Do not leave if you need prayer. I love you. God bless you. Happy birthday. Can't wait to see you next year. I'll see you before that because y'all are coming to hire. Because, see, when you go higher, when you go higher, then you are, remain unshakable. Right? Okay. So I love you so much. Jesus, your love. 